We are ready to start the post-lunch session. So we are very happy to have Andy Brandhuber telling us about classical general relativity from amplitudes and a new double cop. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> big thank you to the organizers uh, to bring me here and to uh, set up this fantastic meeting and also providing excellent weather. Um, <clears throat> it's really it's only my, my second <clears throat> post-pandemic meeting in person, and yeah, it's beautiful to see people live, not on screens. So the title of the talk is Classical General Relativity from Amplitudes and a Novel Double Copy. I should also apologize, I'm probably the, the only, or someone, an oddball here, insisting on setting H bar to zero, zero, all the others are doing quantum stuff. But still, I hope uh, it will trigger some interest. Now, this is uh, work that happened over the last two years, roughly, with Gang Chen, fantastic postdoc, Henry Johansson, Gabriele Taraglini, and Konka Van, and three fantastic uh, PhD students. And I chose to start my introductory motivational part with this iconic uh, picture. I don't know if you remember the day when the first discovery of gravitational waves due to the collision of two black holes was announced. I still remember I was at the airport flying to ski sometime in February. And it's really a fantastic area. Um, for new observational physics, and by now, of the order of 90 binary mergers have been detected by these uh, three collaborations, which is a major success. And let's look a little bit on this picture here. It's maybe hard to see here, but you see that the bulk of the events here involves black holes that have masses of the order of 10 solar masses, usually relatively similar mass ratios, but there are also some events where neutron stars are involved, either two neutron stars producing a black hole or a neutron star and black hole uh, collisions. Um, the good news is that uh, we can expect many more things in the future. There are several new observer observatories in the pipeline which should go online, hopefully in the 2030s, including a space-based uh, observatory. And that will largely increase the scope of gravitational wave physics. First of all, there will be an increase in sensitivity, but also many different events will be uh, seen that cannot be detected by the current observatories. So the, the thing I mentioned before, that we mostly saw um, collisions of almost equal mass black holes. It's not necessarily what happens in nature, but it's th these kind of events that these detectors can see. But for example, if you want to see a supermassive black hole colliding with a solar uh, mass black hole, you need a different frequency range, uh, and something like LISA can provide uh, insight into that. And there's huge physics potential, both astrophysical and for fundamental physics. We will understand much better um, how black hole formation happens and how often this happens before gravitational waves were discovered. No one knew how many black holes are really out there. What is the production rate? Um, we will also learn about more exotic objects like neutron stars, the equation of state, uh, strong interacting matter, um, and potentially also discover new sources of gravitational waves, for example, um, cosmic strings, or there might also be some uh, gravitational wave background radiation uh, coming from the early days of the universe that might be seen there. And for fundamental physics, first of all, it will provide, or this provides a precision test of GR for strong fields, albeit classically. So here we only talk about classical physics. And with increased sensitivity, we might again think about, can we see here uh, modifications due to modified GR or higher deriv derivative corrections that come, for example, from string theory. So these are many important aspects, and all of them will need uh, high precision theory predictions, which is the main goal of this talk. So there's a lot of motivation to, to push the state of the art. Now, I myself am currently an amplitudologist. 
So you might wonder how can amplitude technology help us with this problem. In amplitudes we are used to solving such problems, scattering problems like in particle colliders, um, but we use quantum field theory with h-bar finite, we do loops, um, which is related to the h-bar expansion. How can we relate this to here where we really have a bound state problem? And we are only interested in solving the classical Einstein equations. But of course, these are highly nonlinear equations. And if you s try to solve them iteratively, you actually also end up doing integrals that look very similar to what you do uh, with Feynman integrals. Um, and also black holes yet have a certain size, Schwarzschild radius order of kilometers. You think of them as, as big objects, but you have to think of the, the length scales involved. Now the length scale is given by the distance of the two black holes, which is usually at this stage where they spiral around each other, say 100 kilometers, so it's much larger than that. And the wavelength of the gravitational waves is even larger. So effectively, really, the black holes and neutrons can be treated as point particles. So we in an EFT sense, so yeah, we can use QFT uh, methods. And if we work in the perturbative regime, we can unleash, unleash then the full arsenal of advanced amplitude techniques, which luckily are very adaptable for different problems. And this already led to improvements in the state of the art and several new, more efficient techniques to, in general, compute what people call um, observables in classical GR. Oops, I don't need to press here. So let's look at the typical process in some more detail in the binary problem. There's essentially three phases. Um, there's a so-called in-spiral, -spir where the two heavy objects rotate around each other. The system loses energy due to gravitational ra radiation. The radius shrinks. These guys speed up. And then they go into the merger region, and finally, so form one distorted black hole, and that shakes off its energy uh, in the ring down phase. And it's this phase here that we can uh, treat perturbatively, while the merger region has to be treated numerically, which is computationally very expensive and also takes a lot of time. And gravitational physicists want to produce a lot of waveforms of templates, like long catalogs of different events with different in initial conditions. So it's really important if we can improve the precision here. This is important in particular if you have, if you have many cycles. Um, this is particularly crucial if you have <clears throat> extreme mass ratios, so a supermassive black hole with a very small one, then you will have many, many cycles, tens of thousands. And of course, any error will add up here. And doing this numerically would be completely impossible. So theory has to help. And also, it is important, of course, to push as close to this boundary where numerics uh, takes over. <clears throat> now, in these games, there are mainly two different kinds of expansions used. I will mainly talk about the post mikovskian expansion. That's where field theory is the most natural one, which has expand in your coupling constant, which is G Newton. But you don't expand anything else, so you will be exact in velocity. This is fully relativistic. And it's ideally suited for amplitude methods. There's no real gain to do a further expansion. You actually make things more messy from the amplitude uh, point of view. And if people talk about an NPM contribution, that, that N corresponds to N minus one loops. So one PM is three level. 2 p.m. is one loop, and so forth. Um, but there have been many other efficient methods around for a while, for example, non-relativistic world line effective field theory approaches that do a further expansion, and that goes under the name of post-Newtonian expansion. So here you think, at this stage here, you have a quasi-circular orbit, and you can use the real theorem to relate the potential energy to the kinetic energy, and you assume that the velocity is smaller than 1. So you also expand in B. But this, of course, uh, breaks um, Lorentz symmetry, um, and you will only get it up to a certain number of terms. Now, what's the state of the art of concrete computations? The horizontal lines 
correspond to different levels of the post minkowski expansion. And there we have currently um, reached the three loop level. Now this means always you go here to any order in V while the PN expansion goes in these diagonal lines and currently is at 6 PN order. So this always has a limitation in how many powers of V you get but it's a little bit ahead of the PM expansion in terms of G so it can already capture in principle G to the 6 and G to the 7 uh, terms. Okay, this is all on the generalities. Um, any questions so far? So, a quick outline of what I want to do in the rest of this talk. I want to talk about. The place that you call Ring Down, you also name as perturbative, and I understand that it's an mm -hmm. easy calculation. Easy, uh, it's a different one. Yeah, why, why the methods you will discuss do not apply there? There you can do something else. Essentially, you take a, a solution and, and look at quasi normal modes. Yeah, so it's, a, it's also a perturbative expansion around a given background. I think people actually use numerics because it's relatively easy to compute that. So that part is not so difficult to get. This is really the, the crucial one. Because also this, for different processes, can be very long. Um, and there you have to gain precision, yeah. But of course here, a scattering process would not play the role. Here we're already are down to one object that is just deformed in some way. <clears throat> From now on, I want to tell you about how we can learn about binary dynamics uh, from amplitudes. Particularly, we'll explain how we can take the classical limit, the h bar to zero, zero limit, which is um, more subtle than you might think. If you have worked for years or decades uh, doing usual loops and, and quantum stuff, and suddenly you send h bar to zero, <clears throat> there's some unusual things happening. And as a warm up, I will show you how, from an amplitude, we can find the effective potential of Hamiltonian, and in particular, how we recover Newton's law. And then later, <clears throat> um, and you can think of this as Hamiltonian is not actually an observable, but a pre-observable that gravitational physicists want. They need um, this to compute their waveforms. Um, here we'll discuss a closely related quantity, which is an actual observable, the scattering angle uh, that two bodies experience up to two loops from this heavy mass effective theory which we <clears throat> developed over the last uh, two years. This is a more refined and efficient method. And kind of as byproducts from these um, considerations, we found a new version of the famous double copy due to Bern, uh, Tarasco and Johansson. In a nutshell, is, this tells you, you know, Young Mills is easy, young Mills amplitudes can be computed quite easily if you present them in the appropriate form. You can simply square them to get gravity amplitudes which are notoriously difficult to get and th these are things we need for these computations. And as a further kind of mathematical fun result, we found uh, the so-called kinematic algebra which is in parallel to the color Lie algebra in, in young Mills amplitudes and found a candidate for that as quasi shuffle hop algebra. Um, okay, let's start with the binary then dynamics from amplitudes. In order to find waveforms in essentially, um, you need two quantities, an effective two body Hamiltonian that describes the conservative two body dynamics, so basically the, the potential and all the GR corrections to the Newton potential. And of course, there's a dissipative term that is due to the energy loss due to gravitational uh, radiation. And we will focus on this guy. And it turns out that the two body dynamics, the bound set dynamics can be related to the scattering problem in QFT. Maybe not 
too surprising anyway, but there's, it's maybe not an equal sign, but there's a very precise map between effective Hamiltonian you get from the scattering process to the Hamiltonian you need for the bound state problem. This was uh, developed by many people. Interestingly, the first person who looked at this at one loop level, 2 p.m., was Iwasaki in 1971. And also curiously, he, co he commented in his abstract, it will be shown that despite of the unrenormalizability of gravity, we can obtain a finite physically meaningful potential. So he was kind of himself surprised that he can compute something useful uh, from GR. Of course, we're not so surprised about that. We should think of GR as an low energy effective theory. And here we are really interested in very low energy, classical long range, physics, which is not affected by short distance uh, UV effects. So to set up the problem more concretely, um, we look here at two Schwarzschild black holes, so black holes without any spin. And we assume there's also no substructure, tidal effects or anything, so no neutron stars. Uh, and we will model them by two massive scalars with mass M1 and M2 that don't interact with each other three potential, only gravitationally uh, due to graviton exchange. Um, you have a few details on the kinematic end. Set up here the incoming momenta P1, P2. The center of mass frame, they can be written like this. And it's also convenient to introduce the relevant four velocities. Um, and from these, one introduces this kinematic variable, simply the dot product of these two guys, which is often used to express the answers. Later, we'll also use the, the average of, say, the incoming and the outcoming momenta, but this is not really important. This is a technical detail. But another important kinematic quantity is the momentum transfer, so it's basically the momentum that flows in this direction. This is always much smaller compared to the masses and momenta of the black holes. So it's, it's always soft. Now, if you do the simplest computation, three level, uh, one Feynman diagram to work out, and you get uh, this answer. In particular, there's one over momentum transfer squared. I should also mention here um, that this is a space-like momentum. So in my convention, Q squared would be a negative number. This is minus q vector squared. And there are also further terms, actually. They don't depend on q. You could call them contact terms. They don't really contribute uh, to the potential. Now, now we want to see how we can extract from this uh, some more physical quantity, namely the potential. And for this, we will have to take the classical limit. And that this requires to put h bars back. Um, and this was nicely explained in the paper by Kosova, Mabe, and O'Connell. So what you have to do, you have to rescale the couplings as such. Kappa is essentially square root of g and has to be <coughs> divided by square root of h bar. The momentum and masses of the massive objects are not changed. Quantum mechanical and classical, the, these quantities make, make sense, but it doesn't make sense to talk about, say, the energy of a photon or graviton. They don't exist classically. But what you can keep fixed is their wave number. So what we do, uh, the momentum transfer Q, or any momenta that are of gravitons that are exchanged between the two massive objects are rescaled like this. The witness wave number times h bar, and you keep the wave number fixed. Now this leads to a rather weird result. If you look at this for the first time, this, quant this amplitude becomes highly divergent. And furthermore, it has different powers of h bar sitting in there. So this term here effectively looks like a quantum effect compared to this one, although you did a three-level amplitude. So you see already um, there's some funny uh, business happening with the h bar counting. Now finally, of course, the amplitude is not a physical observable, but we can get from it the potential by a Fourier transform, standard thing in quantum mechanics. I mean, usually we do it the other way around. We have the interaction, Hamiltonian, um, and to get from it the, the amplitude, you do some reverse of this Fourier transform. In any case, there are two places where we have h bars here in the exponent. 
Now writing Q as Q bar times H bar gets rid of the H bar. And the measure of Q here, Q to the three gives us three powers of H bar, which cancels the H bars in the tree amplitude. And if we take the Y to one limit, we get Newton's potential. Okay? Yeah, and the coupling. Because we had a 1 over Q squared that gives 1 over H bar squared, and the G gives a 1 over H bar. Can I ask a stupid question? Yeah? Is this unique to 3 plus 1 dimensions, or is this The powers will change. Well, I would have to do, redo the exercise. I'm sure you can do it there as well. Um, why is the S channel? There is none. We model it such that the two scalars don't interact with, they're like two different flavors. We only allow interactions due to gravitons. There's no annihilation answer, yeah. Otherwise this would yeah, create funny things. Yes, the U channel is part of the same analysis, it's the same. Yeah. So, so that these scalars never disappear and are created again. They, they just, I mean, essentially you want to mimic here some classical source, um, and you want to avoid uh, such things. Now, of course, the full answer already contains more information, also relativistic velocity uh, corrections. But, and of course, now you could go on, compute higher loops and do this Fourier transform and get further corrections to the effective uh, potential. That's exactly what uh, gravitational wave people uh, want. Um, on the other hand, the Hamiltonian is not uniquely defined. It's coordinate dependent. OK, it's not a super important issue. So later, we'll look at a different observable, namely the scattering angle. but. It really contains the same information. Once you have the scattering angle, you can then reconstruct the Hamiltonian that gives you this scattering angle. It contains the same uh, information. But first, since, since we're still with this H bar counting, let's look at loops. Um, let's go to one loops. Here we now consider two graviton exchanges. And this, if you write down Feynman rules, you get kind of these three types of diagrams, kind of box diagram, triangles, and bubbles. Now, since you went one loop up, you expect it to now have a quantum effect, naively. So you should only have that, 1 over h bar squared. That's a bubble integral divergent. Um, but actually, there are two more terms. And actually, this amplitude is even more divergent in the h bar to zero limit. So the people call these often hyperclassical terms. And then there are things in between. They have the right power to contribute classically. And the Q dependency is 1 over square root of minus Q squared, which after the Fourier transform gives you 1 over R squared. So this gives you 1 over R squared corrections to the potential compared to the leading 1 over R from Newton. So why does this jumble of different parts of H bar happen here? If you have only massless particles, all this wouldn't happen because then you would have a unique H bar scaling. But if you look at the massive propagator, for example, here, you have P plus a soft momentum L. Now you replace this by H bar L bar, and you see here you get two terms with different powers of H bar. So if you start expanding that, you will produce different terms. So actually out of this integral comes this term, which is classical, plus another term, which is in log Q squared, but is 1 over H bar squared, and we drop. Then there are also these things. These hyperclassical terms, often they're called iterating terms. Effectively, they arise that they come from basically squaring the 1 p.m. answer, then the three level exchange, and should actually be removed. Uh, so physical observables will not have this, but this we will see, see later, so I don't want to dwell too much on it. But this is an important comment here as well. We're only interested in long range physics due to the propagation of massless particles. And these always produce non-analytic term and amplitudes. 
and we only need to keep those. We don't have to actually compute complete amplitudes. If you have polynomial terms in Q, you can immediately throw them away because the Fourier transform can only give you delta functions or derivatives thereof, so it has no effect on long-range physics. Um, but things like this, 1 over Q squared, 1 over square root of minus Q squared, this we keep. But, but this is exactly what we want. They have these continuities, and they are detected by unitarity cuts, and we are using unitarity techniques. But we can really honestly, we don't have to spend any energy to, of recovering such things. The polynomial count, you just throw them away, or you fast work out the counterparts? No, we throw them away in the h bar. But they come at different powers of h bar, so we, this is a quantum. It might have an effect, but not the order. It has an effect locally. The counterterm is local, but has no longer. No, I know, but you, know, you have to include it to correctly account for overlapping the legends. You're not going to find the problem further down in the vertex. This, 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 this is in, in the full amplitude. In, in the full amplitude, this will be true, but if you only extract the classical stuff, you don't have these divergences. There are no UV divergent integrals once you do this soft expansion. So that's why it's also, as I will argue, important to expand as early as possible because otherwise you start working out a complete amplitude and then only at the end, after all the hard work of integrals and dealing with UV divergences, you drop all this stuff. Has this been done with the loops while you said the first time yeah. were overlapping? <clears throat> but again, it's quantum stuff. It has an extra power of h bar in front. So it's true, this is there, but we, we don't even want to touch it if, if it doesn't contribute. But if you don't expand early, then everything is put together. You have this jumble, and then you decide, ah, okay, this has this h bar power, this has this, and it's better to do it early, otherwise. The remaining integrals are still challenging uh, enough. Oh my god, I'm going way too slow. Okay, so. Now let's talk about black hole scattering from this heavy mass effective theory. So it's same kinematic setup, but now we want to find the so-called scattering angle, which is a function well, of the usual parameters, uh, masses, velocities, and the impact parameter. This is just the offset of the two particles as they approach. And this is related by two-dimensional Fourier transform to the momentum transfer. And the goal is now to actually, ref after explaining the generalities, to, to get to a more refined method of computing things, where we immediately drop stuff that is not relevant uh, to classical physics, so both quantum and hyperclassical stuff. This requires to take the h bar to zero limit as early as possible, and then this idea is really at the heart of many of these new methods that have been developed to do this expansion soon. And this leads us to the heavy mass effective field theory um, and gives us a very efficient amplitude method to compute uh, classical observables in GR. Um, what's the idea here? Well, it really goes back, everyone knows heavy quark effective theory due to Georgia, Georgia and others. You have heavy quarks and they interact due to soft gluons. Now you uh, just change these names, quark to black hole, gluon to graviton, you're doing essentially the same thing. Uh, typically momentum of a massive particle will have a hard momentum plus some of some soft gluon momenta that interacted with it. Um, now write it in this way, m times the velocity. And in the heavy quark effective theory, you then come to a L over m over or QM expansion, so you keep that number small. We actually rescale L by H bar, L, H bar times L bar, but you see this is essentially the same thing. So H bar expansion is equivalent to heavy mass expansion. However, what we don't have to do is to go very deep into this expansion. We're only interested in the classical contribution, so essentially keep uh, the leading term or the, the right terms that, that contribute. And, Another important aspect is you have to also expand your massive uh, propagators. And if you do this here, the first two terms, you see the first 
one gives you then a linearized propagator, 1 over 2 p dot L bar with the 1 over h bar. So that's leading, subleading as the linear guy squared and so forth. Um, otherwise, to then compute and integrate, we use the standard tools that we have in amplitudeology generalized unitarity, so we completely avoid Feynman rules, Lagrangians, and there's a long tool set of integration techniques, including differential equations and so forth, that can in particular be adapted to, to our problem here. Um, so we actually don't do the full loop integration. We work in the so-called soft regions, but this is already obtained by doing this rescaling of the, the loop momentum L to H bar. Um, times L bar. So this basically gets, and then only keeping the right term. So this gets exactly rid of this UV divergence as you um, Costas was mentioning. Other important input in this unitarity cuts are always tree amplitudes. And a very important example of amplitudes here we need is those with two massive scalars and any number of gravitons. But we will also expand them, and that leads us to the so-called heft amplitudes and, and the heft expansion. As a byproduct, if I have time, but probably not, um, we also discovered a novel version of the color kinematic duality for these heft amplitudes, which have some interesting properties. So prototypical unitarity cut diagram in this game looks as follows. We have here a unitarity cut where we cut L plus one graviton propagator, so we put them all on shell. This means the blob up here is an ampli tree amplitude with two massive scalars and L plus one gravitons and the same uh, below. Then, so as, if you work on the cut, now you do the state sums over all these uh, legs and then replace the on-shell delta functions with scalar propagators. So this gives an integrand that uh, is not re reproducing the full amplitude, but gives you those pieces that have discontinuities in the Q-squared channel. And that's the only thing we are really interested in. Um, and there's also a symmetry factor. We have here L plus 1 uh, identical particles. Now, I didn't draw these pictures very nicely, and. I tried to improve it, never managed, but uh, then I said, leave it, because these amplitudes, the three amplitudes, but they're still ugly. They're, they have different powers of H bar inside. There's some structure here that we haven't exposed yet. So it's important to also um, expand uh, these amplitudes to discover some nice systematic um, expansion. And in a nutshell, what we found, this is very nice, that in this expansion, the full tree amplitudes can always be written in terms of so-called so heft amplitudes, which have a very nice simple form, and delta functions. But at three point, nothing really happens. This is just um, the velocity dotted with the polarization vector. Now, if you had a single power, this would be the amplitude for a charged scalar coupling to a, to a gluon. Here's another emergence of the double copy in gravity. You just square this thing. Um, four point is a bit more interesting. The bulk of the result is given by the first example of a heft amplitude, four point, uh, which scales with m squared. I see a massless propagator, some of these two graviton momenta. And here an interesting expression which only contains field strength, so no polarization vectors explicitly. So this is manifestly uh, gauge invariant, and it again has a square here. So if you do this in Young Mills, two gluons, two scalars, you would just remove the square. So again, um, example of this double copy structure, and here linear propagator. But there's a correction term to that which scales with a higher power of m contains a delta function and a product of two such three-point uh, amplitudes, okay? 
So for generic kin kinematics, this is simply zero. You only get this. So if you ignore the i epsilons in your propagators, you don't get that. But if you carefully trace i epsilons, you, you get these delta function terms, which are. And at five point, next is structurally, same story at m squared, we get a five point half amplitude and then correction terms with more and more delta functions, in this case up to two delta functions. Uh, and here we get the three point amplitude times a four point half amplitude that we already saw before. So these half amplitudes are universal building blocks um, of this half expansion or heavy mass expansion of full three level amplitudes. <clears throat> And now we can look um, at explicit loop computations, um, say at one loop. So let me go back a few pictures. We sort of, maybe another one. So here we will have two gravitons into exchange. So we have a four point amplitude here and here. Um, the expansion of that has two terms. And on the top and the bottom of the card, we have two terms. Two, by two times two is four, so we indeed get four terms. Again, this box type diagram, the hyperclassical contribution. These two diagrams that contribute classically and the quantum correction, which we uh, can drop. But these are not Feynman rules. These now involve this, this half amplitude. So directly have a clean um, H bar power. And that's reflected to a clean dependence on the mass. There's a, a distinct power of the masses in front. Yeah, we, we come to that now. That, sorry? What happens to the hyperclassic? That comes, that comes now. Because we still talk about amplitudes, they're not observables. Where do these go? This is related to an old story about iconel phase and so forth, where you try to write the amplitude as the exponential of some iconal phase, we call it heft phase because it's slightly uh, uh, different. And from this phase, you can obtain the scattering angles by simply taking the derivative with respect to the angular momentum. But for this, you have to go to impact parameter space. How is this done? You do a Fourier transform of the amplitude and impose here these two delta functions, which just impose that momentum Q, the momentum transfer is orthogonal to P1 and P2. So this is in four dimensional, two dimensional Fourier transform. Now the nice thing about this is if you have a two massive particle reducible diagram as such, where you have a prop, uh, delta function here and here, uh, then this is really a convolution in momentum space. So there's some subloop, which in impact parameter space becomes a simple product. Okay. So now we can look at this case and actually do Carbot-Ortiz, if you know this famous paper where this scattering process was worked out and the leading iconal approximations are only these three point vertices in one line. Because there you have to read some such diagrams. And you have here, this is multiply decomposable. Each block here corresponds to a tree exchange Looks horribly complicated, L loop computation, but in impact parameter space, this just becomes a product um, of L plus one copies of the tree amplitude in impact parameter space. And thanks to the symmetry factor, we have here a one over L plus one factorial, so you can resum this into an exponential. Okay? Which also tells you you never have to compute these things. If you think in the exponent, you only have to compute the tree once. And the exponent, the expansion of the exponent, gives you back all these, these terms. It turns out you can also generalize this now to higher um, loops. Um, and the rule is always you only include two massive particle irreducible diagrams. And they directly give you the different loop contributions to the phase. And whenever you have diagrams that have something like this, they are produced by expanding the exponent. Um, so at, at one loop, this is just these two 
two guys. This one you don't compute because it comes out of expanding the, the exponential. Now two loops you get still a quite compact set of diagrams that you have to work out with due to historical reasons have, have different names probe limit, conservative, radiation reaction. Radiation reaction is, is here the situation where one of the lines emits a graviton but it gets reabsorbed. So it's not really, it's radiation in some sense but gets reabsorbed. So this still contributes to an elastic process. Um, but the nice thing is here we can isolate cleanly diagrams that we have to compute and you have to don't, you don't have to compute anything else and you don't have to throw anything away. So it's maximally efficient in this sense and also these heft three amplitudes are quite compact. So this is all nice so we can look at, at the final result up to 3 p.m. The first line is the 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. answer and you see a two loop order things become a bit more complicated in terms of functions that appear but it's not terribly bad you have some square roots and some logs hiding inside our cosh. If you go to three loops you also get elliptic functions and dialogues uh, and so forth and computation nicely agrees with results of, of, of others. Uh, how much time? Um, okay so in principle from here on it's, it's easy to obtain integrands actually for, for any order but of course the devil is in the detail you also have to do integrals at some point and currently the bottleneck in this game is to evaluate uh, these relevant master integrals um, we also noticed strong similarities with so-called world line approaches which is effectively you can think of it as, as Wilson lines that mimic uh, the massive objects uh, structurally so it seems we're kind of in a soft spot between pure amplitude minded approach where you have only on shell data no Feynman rules and this uh, world line approach that also directly uh, compute classical quantities where you also don't have this hyper classical quantum stuff also mentioned that the phase um, is not really phase actually, it's also true for the iconal phase, it's actually a complex quantity. Um, and it turns out that the imaginary part, so at one and two loops this doesn't happen, but at two loops you get an imaginary part corresponds to this diagram. And this is essentially, think of the optical theorem, this is like an amplitude squared and the phase space integral done is like the total cross section where you also emit uh, a graviton. So that already knows about radiation effects or dissipation in some sense, but this appears in the imaginary part. Okay, any questions on this? I will rush through this as I think time doesn't permit to say too much here. Um, some more details on this uh, half the amplitudes, I will probably not talk about the kinematic algebra. You can ask me in private. Um, but we obtained basically an all multiplicity answer for these half the amplitudes. In so called colored kinematic dual form, which means if you present the amplitude in this form, you can directly take it, square it, and get um, amplitudes for gravitons. And the interesting is manifestly gauge invariant. Typically, well, the total amplitude, of course, is gauge invariant, but in this double copy or in, where you use Feynman rules, you have several pieces. All of them depend on polarization vectors and not manifestly uh, gauge invariant. So that's quite remarkable, but it seems that this is possible at all is due to the fact that we have these two massive scalars. You have some off shell, in some sense, particles. Uh, uh, fully on shell amplitudes with only um, gravitons or gluons, this um, is not possible. And we also made some inroads to understand the underlying kinematic algebra. Maybe I.
So a quick slide on the double cop. In this sense, what does it mean? Here we have color ordered young males amplitude, so here n minus two gluons. And this V just rep represents these two massive scalars, can be written as a sum over, in a sense, color ordered cubic diagrams as such, where the external lines are fixed, but you write down all possible cubic graphs, you note them by gamma. You have some numerator divided by a set of propagators. Once you have the amplitude in this form, the corresponding heft graviton amplitude is simply given by this. You just square these numerators and now sum over all cubic graphs, ignoring ordering, because in gravity there is no uh, color ordering. Now we map, uh, we express these cubic graphs in terms of nested commutators, but maybe I, I no, I really should skip over this. Um, what we observed when we constructed these this numerators leg by leg, that the number of terms follows a funny sequence. I don't know, some people might know what this sequence is. Anyone knows what this is? So these are the Ifubini numbers. And the general numerator is given as a sum of a, the details of this object is not important. We don't have time for that. But you sum here over a sum over ordered partitions of um, the set 2 to n minus 2 into our subsets. And if you count this number of partitions, you exactly get the Fubini numbers. And since we also were looking for an algebra, you go on Wikipedia and, then, and look around. And indeed, there is a so-called quasi-shuffle-hop algebra that generates all ordered partitions of a given set. So exactly reproduces uh, these uh, Fubini numbers. They have various interesting uses in mathematics, but also for, for horse races. For example, Fubini numbers um, measure the number of possible outcomes of horse races, including uh, ties. So if you have three, for two horses, there are three possible outcomes. Horse one comes first, horse two comes first, or they come together. If you have three horses, you already have 13 possible outcomes. These are some form of Sorry? Some version of bell numbers? Yes, yes. <coughs> I mean, this is only a subset of connections. Yes. Because Inan brought up this is connected to webs, uh, which he is playing with in QCD, and, and these Fubini numbers also show up. Um, but it was funny that it was, we had kind of constructed this thing, experimentally tested, found this number of terms, and then we could match it to some very abstract mathematical object. We still have to really work out the, the full impl implications of this Hopf algebra structure. But we understood now a few more things. For example, the co-product that exists in this Hopf algebra is related to the factorization of these numerators on uh, poles of these massive propagators. Um, what we don't yet have is an explicit realization of the generators that uh, produce this algebra, something like differential uh, operators uh, or some such. Anyway, I'm at, at the end, and I will just leave the conclusions up there and shut up and answer your questions. <laughs> That's a bit more difficult. In the world line formalism, you can add additional high derivative terms um, interactions there. For example, this is what you do when you want to discuss tidal effects, like for neutron stars. 
but we also noticed that some of these word line corrections uh, through field red definitions can be mapped to higher derivative terms uh, added to, uh, to the Einstein Hilbert action. Um, so here's work is still needed. We have already started high derivative, so still looking at point particles, but looking at high derivative corrections to, to Einstein Hilbert gravity and see how this modifies uh, the uh, effective potential. And people have started to um, study spin effects in the context of amplitudes. So like if you want to describe curved black holes that scatter, you would like to have not spinless scalars, but massive spinning particles, uh, two of them interacting with any number of gravitons. And yeah, people have made some, some progress in this direction. So the internal structure of a neutron star, for example, that could be encoded in some high derivative terms? For well, in the world line, this is done, and you put then some coefficients, some reason coefficients. Okay, that that's not no. Uh, in your the, this I, I don't know yet. I think what's crucial is to understand better the, the link between this word line formalism and the amplitude. Structurally, we see a lot of similarities, but we still have to hit a bit harder to, to do things like that, um, which of course would be very useful. Um, but I think also, in, <clears throat> instead of, I mean, to go to higher PM orders, that's the most straightforward thing, but it's technically at some point because you'd have to do hard integrals conceptually, maybe not that exciting. I think the last line is uh, several other important directions that have to be pushed. And also to think of radiation dis dissipation. And in the context of amplitudes, that can easily be done. You just don't do a four point amplitude, but you add some graviton emitted in this process with Fourier transform and you get basically the waveform produced in this process. Anyway, there are still many things to do. And <clears throat> Can you apply these techniques to uh, flat holes collisions in curved space, like in the sitter space? I think we are very bad at scattering things in, in curved space, and I wouldn't. But there, maybe the world line approaches can be applied more readily. Amplitudes in curved track grounds haven't been explored very much, so you don't <coughs> have much in terms of, of input. Um, but you would really have to think about curved spaces where the radius of curvature is comparable to the size of the system, right? Is this, I don't know if it's, I mean, conceptually it might be very interesting to do. Um, practically, I don't know if it's important. Thank you, Andy.